I'd like to introduce you to my new book. It's called The uh, Brief Peaks Beyond. It's coming out now. Uh, it's available for pre-order in all the online stores. And in this video, I just would like to give you an, an overview, a, a sense of what this book is all about, what I think it adds to the discussion, and, and why I wrote it. Um, the original idea for it was to write basically an anthology of essays, uh, many of which uh, uh, I had published before. But as I engaged into the project, I realized that uh, there was much more that could be achieved with it. And although the essay format has been preserved, it's a book of essays, uh, it also has a unifying theme. This book has one unifying message. It's not just uh, a, 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 a collection of disparate essays talking about different subjects. This unifying theme is, is the human condition as it, as it is manifested in the early 20th, 21st century. Um, and I, ex I try to explore this through many different facets in order to build a, a coherent gestalt, a, a coherent idea about uh, how we humans manifest ourselves in the world today. Um, these facets are as diverse as, for instance, science, the way science is defined and practiced today, and perhaps most importantly, the way it is communicated to the public today and the assumptions, the conclusions that it seems to embody uh, and, and to pass on to us as, as people uh, as, as the truth about our condition, about nature and the way we relate to the world. Um, another facet of the human condition today um, is our cultural value system, uh, which is very synergistic with our economic system. Our culture today is mainly driven by materialist assumptions, by a materialist worldview, which is synergistic um, with the economy and present-day entrenched power structures. Um, and in this book, through several essays, I try to, to look critically at it, to, to deconstruct these cultural assumptions as embodied not only in academia, in our educational system, by the but by the mainstream media itself, which, in my view, plays quite an insidious role in, in reinforcing uh, delusions. So these are polemical topics which I have avoided before. I have always concentrated on metaphysics, uh, on philosophy in general. But this time I thought this is the moment to bite this bullet and approach uh, these more human topics in a way, topics related to society, to culture, to education, um, to what's going on in the world today. Uh, although every essay on, in this book is grounded on my metaphysics, and it's grounded on the metaphysics of monistic idealism, this notion that uh, reality is not outside consciousness, reality itself is an excitation of consciousness. We are in consciousness, not consciousness in us. <laughs> In chapter two of this book, I, I summarize uh, my metaphysics and extend on it. Um, essay 2.1, for instance, um, is not only a summary, but an extension of what is discussed in my previous work, Why Materialism is Baloney. It's a more direct, less metaphor-loaded way of, of uh, tackling um, my metaphysical ideas, um, a more declarative way, more to the point, more straightforward. Uh, this is what I try to accomplish in this uh, essay, which is an entirely new essay. Many of the essays in this book are new. They have never been published before. Uh, the essays that have been published before have been largely rewritten, uh, revised, updated, and, and extended. Again, in chapter 2, um, after this summary uh, of my metaphysical ideas in essay 2.1, in the next essay, 2.2, um, which is one of the longest and perhaps one of the most important essays in the book, um, I make a list of the 16 best materialist arguments against idealism, against my metaphysics. These are the things that, uh, when I debate materialists in, in different fora, online and otherwise, they always bring up as arguments against the notion that reality is in consciousness. 
and I tried to make as complete a list as I could of the best arguments I have come across, and I tried to refute them one by one. Um, I, just to give you a gist of, uh, of the kind of criticisms uh, that I have gotten from materialists, uh, I'll, I'll just read to you uh, the list of 16. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to the refutation, the refutation is in the book, uh, I just want to give you a notion uh, of, of, of what I try to refute. Uh, so you see that I'm not backing away from anything. I'm, I'm really going for it. I'm, I'm biting the, the, the bullet here. Uh, the criticisms are written as if, from the, as if with the voice of a materialist arguing against me. Here's the list. Number one, our sense perceptions provide direct evidence for a world outside consciousness. Number two, because we cannot change reality by merely wishing it to be different, it's clear that reality is outside consciousness. These are two examples of criticisms that beg the question, they embody circular reasoning. Number three, because we are separate beings inhabiting the same external world, reality has to be outside consciousness. Number four, and this one was used against me by Jerry Coyne, a relatively well-known materialist and neo-Darwinist, and it's an obvious example of begging the question of circular reasoning. He said, it is untenable to maintain that there is no reality independent of consciousness, for there is plenty of evidence about what was going on in the universe before consciousness evolved. Clear circular reasoning, and I explore this uh, quite extensively in the book. Number five. It is not parsimonious to say that reality is in consciousness because that would require postulating an unfathomably complex entity to be imagining reality. That's entirely wrong. Number six, reality is clearly not, not inside our heads, therefore monistic idealism is wrong. Total misunderstanding of what monistic idealism is. Number seven, monistic idealism is too metaphysical. This is a, a nice one. Number eight, there are strong correlations between brain activity and subjective experience. Clearly thus, the brain generates consciousness. This criticism reflects a tremendous lack of imagination, theoretical imagination. Number nine, unconscious brain activity precedes the awareness of certain decisions, showing a clear arrow of causation from purely material processes to experience. This is a criticism that reflects a misunderstanding of what unconscious processes, so-called unconscious mental processes are, it reflects a misunderstanding of the nature of the so-called unconscious. Number 10, bear with me, there are 16. Because psychoactive drugs and brain trauma can markedly change subjective experience, it's clear that the brain generates consciousness. Again, this reflects a misunderstanding of what physical phenomena are in the context of idealism. I explore, of course, this in many more details uh, in the book. Number 11. During dreamless sleep, or under general anesthesia, we are clearly unconscious. Yet, we don't cease to exist because we become temporarily unconscious. Obviously, then, reality cannot be in consciousness. This is just a, a, a mix-up. Uh, this criticism mixes up a lack of memory with lack of consciousness. Criticism 12. The stability and consistency of the laws of physics show that reality is outside consciousness. Number 13. To postulate a collective and obfuscated part of consciousness as the source of consensus reality is equivalent to postulating a reality outside consciousness. That is not so at all. I discussed this in this essay, 2.2, and I also used chapter 8 with several essays to expand on all this, because chapter 8 expands not only on the implications of idealism as a metaphysics, but also on the applications of idealism, idealism, clearly showing everything that would be different in the way we relate to the world, to ourselves, in the way we develop our technology, in the way we, we deal with our, our, with our health care, and the way we go about life, if idealism is true as opposed to materialism. So these things are not uh, equivalent uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Number 14. Why would consciousness deceive us by simulating a materialist world? Uh, I, I, let me comment on this a little bit. This really shows closed box thinking. It shows how much materialists are locked into their own mental schemes, in their own way of thinking, their own box. Uh, just to give you a gist uh, of, of the answer, I start the refutation by saying this. Was planet Earth deceiving us until a few hundred years ago 
by simulating a flat world? Was the sun deceiving us by pretending to move around the earth? Well, you, you get the gist of it. You see where I'm going with this. Number 15. Monistic idealism is solipsistic and as such unfalsifiable. It's a total misunderstanding of what idealism and sol solipsism are. Number 16, and the final one, and my, my personal favorite, one cannot prove that monistic idealism is true. I had a lot of fun refuting uh, this, this particular one uh, in the book. Uh, I will let you have a look at it yourself. I continue on with new essays in chapter 2. I, I, essay 2.3, I use the format of a little story, a little myth, uh, based on a dream to convey a feeling for how one could look upon reality from an idealist perspective and how reality would make absolute sense from that perspective. Uh, there are many other things I discuss in, in, in chapter 2. There is one essay in which I talk about God, a subject I have thus far uh, avoided because it's such an overloaded word, the word God. But I bite the bullet and I discuss this fully. Um, it's something I had written about before, but uh, in this book my original essay has been largely revised and extended substantially uh, to make my case more and more thoroughly. Um, just to convey the conclusion, uh, uh, the conclusion of the essay is that uh, God is right, it is there, and it's not somewhere invisible, it's all around us, and nature itself is evidence uh, for God. And I discuss why, uh, in, in what I believe is quite a coherent and logical way. Then we have chapter 3, uh, which goes beyond metaphysics. Um, chapter 3 goes into uh, a discussion of consciousness, uh, neuroscience, memory, and the role of the media in, in, in divulging the latest scientific results uh, on these areas, a role that I believe is quite biased. I discuss the heart problem, I, I critique and deconstruct the, the so-called um, eliminative materialist position which denies the very existence of consciousness. I try to show how tenable this is. Uh, I discuss the latest scientific results uh, in the study of memory, where in the brain it might be, how it can be retrieved and so on. And I try to show how internally contradictory these latest results are, how, are, how they seem to contradict one another, and how the media, despite this, seems to spin them so as to corroborate the materialist hypothesis of memory, the idea that memories are stored as data, as physical traces in the brain. Uh, and I think you you enjoy uh, all the details that I discuss because I went in, into quite some depth in, the, in depth uh, in this. In chapter four, I talk about skepticism and science. Uh, most of the essays uh, are rewritten, uh, revised, and extended versions of the things I have written before. Uh, there is one that is brand new. Um, it's about Darwinian evolution, the idea of revolution by natural selection, which I've discussed in a video before, but never in written format. And this time I go into quite some depth. Um, the core of the essay is the notion that although there is a lot of evidence, overwhelming evidence even, for evolution by natural selection, which is something I don't deny, on the contrary, um, I regret that the neo-Darwinists seem to conflate this this notion, for which there is empirical evidence, with another notion for which there is precisely zero empirical evidence, which is the idea that the, the genetic mutations underlying evolution are themselves random, patternless, have no telos, and unfold along no identifiable trends. We don't know that, we just don't have the data to run a randomness test to substantiate this conclusion. So it's, it's just an article of faith, and I discuss this quite extensively in this essay. In chapter 5, I talk about uh, culture and society, uh, our current value systems as reinforced by the culture, as reinforced by the media, by our the educational system in academia, even in school. Um, the way, for instance, our educational system seems to be trying to turn us into mere cogs in the machine, uh, turn us into skilled tools by providing us with a merely utilitarian education as opposed to a philosophical education that equips us to express ourselves in the world, to make sense of life and, and, and our position in nature, uh, to give us meaning, um, instead of all these things which are the ultimate 
things in life. Uh, after all, why are we alive other than to express ourselves in the world and to play a certain role in the bigger context of things? Instead of equipping us to do this, our education and our cultural value systems seem to try to inculcate into us the idea that we are tools, that we should be educated for the performance of tasks and question as little as possible and just contribute to the current system, the current power structures, in a way like, like machines, which is of course something that is endorsed by the materialist perspective, which sees us as biological robots, uh, a perspective that is endorsed by academia uh, today, unfortunately. I discuss this and, and much more in this chapter. I discuss upcoming changes in our culture and our society, which I think are inevitable. I discuss the role of philosophy. I discuss myths, mythology. I discuss um, the lost sense of enchantment that, uh, that we've lost somewhere along the way since the, the Enlightenment. Um, I discuss um, our projections. Uh, in fact, I defend the point of view in one of the essays 5.6 called The Cultural Narrative of Projections, that our entire culture is based on projections. We project onto our experiences aspects of ourselves and we make them uh, external. Uh, we, we, we assume them to be outside of ourselves and we create an entire cultural narrative fundamentally based on projections all over the place. In chapter 6, I talk about the strange and mysterious. I discuss near-death experiences, I discuss UFOs, extraterrestrial life. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, one of the subjects I tackle in one of the essays is uh, this idea that, uh, this fact that many reports of near-death experiences contain contradictory metaphors that are largely and clearly motivated by the cultural background of the individual. Somebody, a, a Buddhist from Asia, will report a different near-death experience than a Christian from the United States, for instance. Uh, but I defend and I substantiate the idea that uh, this is not a reason to dismiss the reality of near-death experiences. To believe so uh, is a, a, the reflection of a prejudice. We are projecting onto all possible realms of experience characteristics of this particular realm that we live in ordinarily. In other words, the idea that reality is independent of our expectations, of our, of our memories, of our prior experiences. This is a characteristic of this consensus realm of experience that we call the real world. But it is not necessary. There's no a priori reason to project this same characteristic onto a postulated, hypothesized, afterlife realm in which the reality experienced can be dressed, coated with the expectations of the experiencer. And this is something I elaborate upon in this chapter. Chapter 7 is about free will, which is something I touched upon in my previous book, Why Materialism is Baloney, but I did not treat it with the appropriate amount of depth. And I've written some essays afterwards about it, but in this chapter I consolidate it all, I extend it, and I think this is all I will ever need to write about free will. I feel quite happy with this chapter, I think I've pinned down the issue to my own satisfaction. I talk about it uh, generically in one essay, and then I relate it to the metaphysics of idealism in another essay, and I try to show the relationship between free will on the one hand and determinism and randomness on the other. Is there semantic space to talk about free will without it being either determined or random, totally undetermined? Uh, I discussed this, I think it's a very delicate issue, uh, but I'm happy uh, w w with the result uh, uh, of these essays. Uh, they satisfy me, uh, I hope they are useful and valuable to, to you too. Chapter 8 is about practical applications. Um, I have always discussed philosophy purely for the sake of philosophy, and some people have criticized me in the sense that, you know, after listening to me, they say, yes, very well, you defend it very well, you have a point, but so what? What does it mean to me? How will it change my life? What will I do different tomorrow if I believe uh, in idealism, in your, in your metaphysical position? Uh, and I decided to... Uh, 
add several essays to this chapter in which I explore exactly this. One essay explores the applications and implications of idealism in a generic sense, and then I go into more depth into specific subjects like um, medicine, well, wellness, well-being, healthcare. Uh, how would healthcare be different under idealism? And there would be many, many differences. Uh, the implications are astounding when you get into the details. Um, I also discuss something I have thus far always avoided because I have some prejudice about it, I confess to it. It is the so-called law of attraction that is popularly discussed today since that movie, The Secret. Um, I confess to having some prejudice about it. Uh, I find the way it's discussed, communicated and promoted today distasteful. It's my personal opinion, which I'm entitled uh, to. Uh, sometimes misrepresented and brought too far. And Generally, I don't like it. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't any merit to it. After all, uh, some people point out, well, if reality is in consciousness, isn't it a straightforward conclusion that our thoughts can affect reality directly? I don't think it's a straightforward conclusion at all. I don't think idealism necessarily corroborates the law of attraction, but it doesn't refute it either. And there's a lot of nuance uh, that one should look at. This is a long essay, it's a new essay, I had never written about it before uh, in, in, to this extent. Uh, and I think it's one of the most worthwhile essays uh, in the book as well. I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with it as well. The final essay uh, is about uh, what we can do as individuals to try to change the dire course of our society, of our civilization, of our culture today. It's bringing us in a direction that is unsustainable, both from a physical perspective, the use of resources, pollution, climate change, and so on, and from a psychological perspective, we cannot carry on living in a vacuum of meaning with a total lack of relationship with transcendence uh, anymore. This is not sustainable. To change that course, many things could be done, but I think all change starts with the individual. It starts with us and it ends with us. And in this essay, which is a revised and extended version of something I wrote before, I try to look into what we could do or rather stop doing as individuals in order to enable and accelerate that change. Chapter 9 is the final chapter of the book. In that chapter I try to bring it all together uh, to make sense of all these disparate subjects, science, culture, uh, uh, the law of attraction and metaphysics and bring it all together in a coherent way and extract some general conclusions, uh, lay, lay out a general perspective, uh, a, a general meaning. Well, what does it all mean when we bring it all together? That's what I try to, to do in this final chapter, which is called The Takeaway Message. Uh, it's a self-descriptive uh, title, I believe. This book is the result of a lot of work uh, a lot of passion, a lot of commitment. I've really poured my soul in it. I think it's the most important thing uh, I have published so far. Of course, I'm always busy with new things. I'm already busy with something else, which I think will be even more important than this. Uh, but in published format, I think this is the best I've done so far. And I truly hope that you find value in it as well.